start off with some basic rules of probability. You should all know these, even intuitively, if you don't know them from mathematics. But if you've got mutually exclusive events, their probabilities, if you want one or the other, don't care, is the sum. If you've got events that are not mutually exclusive and you want both to occur, you're dealing with the product of the probabilities. So, thinking in terms of gambling, rolling snake eyes, probability is just 1 in 36. Either snake eyes or box cars is the sum of those two probabilities, or 1 in 18. Hardy-Weinberg, again, basic probability of two random gametes fusing, given that they come from the same population with allele frequencies. So, we're talking about a single nucleotide polymorphism. When will a SNP show a most, at what allele frequency will a SNP most likely show a different genotype between two unrelated individuals? And you will remember I said before, whoops, that it was 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and mathematically you can calculate it, and that would be the answer. So, the probabilities of two independent events, the probability of each as a product of one or two or more mutually exclusive, the sum. So the probability of two individuals having the same genotype at one SNP is this, simply the difference between one and the previous one. So for individual identification, not particularly of interest to anthropology, but certainly a major issue, and the main way DNA is now used in forensics. We want to find SNPs with high heterozygosity, i.e. close to 0 0.5, 0 0.5, to minimize the probability of two unrelated individuals being the same, and we want to find SNPs that have the smallest allele frequency variation around the world. So the probability is not related to ancestry. Right now, for the CODIS markers in court, you need to present the probability of this genotype for which the defendant matches the crime scene DNA. If it's African American, if it's European American, if it's Asian, in some cases, if it's Hispanic. Hispanic has no genetic meaning whatsoever. Um, but the US Census has it, so when we fill out a grant application, we have to say, are we studying Hispanics, et cetera, um, and have to justify, no, because <laughs> it's a genetic study. So we identified a set of SNPs, uh, 40 of them, that constituted a good preliminary panel and published it. And here are the match probabilities, again, around the world. Mabuti is a very small isolated pygmy group. 
I've already mentioned the Samaritans. The Nasioi, ah, who wants to explain who the Nasioi are? <laughs> okay, they were part of her PhD work. Um, it is one group on the island of Bougainville off of Papua New Guinea, one of the Solomon Islands. There are 27 different languages spoken on that island, meaning 27 different tribes, if you will, or ethnic groups, and this is one of them. So it is isolated, it's relatively small, and then the various uh, Mexican Pima and the Surui from the Amazon Basin, also relatively isolated and low amounts of genetic variation. And yet, look, even the Nasioi, the probability of an unrelated individual being the same is less than 10 to the minus 12. This is in the range of what the CODIS markers give, even in European populations. So we've subsequently published 45 SNPs that get up another two orders of magnitude, improved over this, and that's being worked into um, commercial kits, we hope. Uh, though, I just want to mention, there are ethical problems in dealing with these kinds of studies. Um, and our informed consent says there will be no intellectual property or commercial use based on studies of these samples. All data must be made public. So when I talk about commercial panels, I don't get a penny out of it. This is uh, free for any company to develop. The data are publicly available. Here are just examples of two with the lowest variation out of that panel. And you can see they're pretty uniform in the allele frequencies. So, for ancestry identification, empirically, clearly, allele frequencies vary around the world, and the underlying principle is that the population in which the observed genotype is most likely to occur is the population that the unknown is most likely to come from. Now, every genotype is rare in every population. So the absolute probability is meaningless. We have to think in terms of likelihood and relative likelihoods to interpret. So likelihood is related to probability. But probability is the probability of an outcome given a hypothesis. Snake eyes, given the hypothesis that each die has six sides, only one of which is a one, and both are unloaded. So it's one six times one six. So there's a clear hypothesis. Likelihood is the likelihood of a hypothesis given a set of data. So what if you rolled a pair of dies and you rolled them 500 times and you never got snake eyes? So here's your data. What's your hypothesis? I think they're probably loaded. So you talk about the relative likelihood of different amounts of loading. So likelihood is proportional to the hypothesis, to the 
event given the hypothesis. So it's a proportionality, but the constant of proportionality cancels out, and that's why we look at relative likelihoods. So if we've got two different hypotheses, let's flip a coin. We expect heads and tails 50% of the time. I flip the coin a hundred times, it always comes up heads. I've got two hypotheses. It's a coin with two heads, or I've been very unlucky. <laughs> the probability in, if it's a coin with heads and tails is very low. The probability if it's heads only, both heads, is one the probability of that outcome under that hypothesis. So we can look at the relative likelihoods of those two hypotheses. So a slight digression, but it becomes um, relevant. There are lots of scientific issues in forensic DNA use. And these are scientific in quote because they're related to quality of DNA, um, the use to which it's put, how close a match is it likely to be a relative versus just, there's always a probability of a close match. So none of this is foolproof. The underlying science can be pretty rigorous, but the implementation is not always, and that's important. So we've always got chain of custody. Uh, when I've testified, you know, is this the pattern of the defendant and the DNA? I say, those two patterns are the same. That's all I can say. If that really is the DNA of the defendant, and that really is the DNA of, from the crime scene, then yes, they're the same. But as an expert who hasn't been involved, that's a chain of custody issue that I can't attest to. So all of this becomes relevant. So let me talk a bit about another resource and that is Alfred. It's a database that I started in the late, um, the mid-1990s, I guess. We're currently up to 35 million allele frequencies where um, you can learn about an allele if it's been studied extensively. And here is the um, front page, the home page. Um, we can look here. There are 35 million allele frequency tables for a molecularly defined DNA polymorphism in an anthropologically defined population with links to um, anthropology databases, molecular databases, et cetera, to provide that resource. And as a reasonably new feature, we've added SNP sets to the database because as a forensic scientist, you wouldn't be interested in one SNP. You'd be interested in an um, ethnic identification or ancestry identification panel of SNPs. So we have several here, some of which come from our lab. Um, the SNP for ID group, Sanchez, Phillips, um, the CODIS DNA markers, and there are some other sets that didn't fit on the screenshot. 
here is going into what we have as our final set of 45 uh, best unlinked markers. And we can sort this list by any of several criteria. And we can also uh, click for other views. Um, for ancestry informative markers, um, we're interested in allele frequencies in different populations. You have to have that support. And so to make these data meaningful, we have all of that support in Alfred online as a reference that hasn't been tested but should be readily acceptable in a court because it's publicly available and highly vetted by publications supporting the data. Um, so the opposite of II SNPs, the highly variable SNPs, here are five uh, different ones that vary a lot around the world. Uh, there are multiple panels, not just the one we're trying to work on now. No single panel is going to be perfect. Um, but the problem is most of the existing panels that are out there and also used for ancestry identification tend to be based on continental samples. Asian, European, African, Native American, most not even Native Americans, as though all Africans are the same, all Asians are the same, etc. Only one panel published by Selden of 128 SNPs has been studied on a lot of samples. Uh, his panel was published by Kosoi um, et al. in 2009. And this spring, or this winter, January, my wife, that's the kid there, um, extended that by pulling data in from other databases and 57 populations from our lab to bring it up to almost 5,000 5, individuals from 119 different populations. Um, more on that, here's one of the SNP panels that the ancestry panels from the SNP for ID group and you see DARC here. Remember, that's the Duffy blood group. If you went in the real online version and clicked Google Map, you would get this generated out of our database. And you can see that here, the C allele that provides that resistance to Vivax malaria essentially fixed across tropical um, Africa becomes very rare in northern Africa, but it's present also in the Mediterranean population and then essentially absent every place else. Here, two of the skin color genes. I showed you before those surfer plots of two of them. Here are two. One of them, the red one, has a much more geographically restricted distribution than the other one. Notice Southwest Asia. The blue one is still nearly fixed for the light skin allele, but the other light skin allele is 40 to 50 percent allele frequency. The same with moving into Central Asia. You see a rap rapid decrease in um, the red and still a reasonably high frequency of blue in the other. Elsewhere in the world, both are quite uncommon. In North 
Europe. The right-hand side here are the northern European populations. Clearly, both are essentially at 100% frequency. So we're working to try to find more of these alleles in a good set. And as that figure just showed, phenotype informative can also be ancestry informative. So we're trying to include both. So one of the things we'll talk about and show you and you get to play with tomorrow is a set of 39 provisional ancestry informative markers that have been studied now in 43 populations. And you can put in an individual's genotype and find out what population that individual came from by relative likelihoods. Here is a structure plot. You'll also get a chance to use this tomorrow where the program, if you tell it how many groups of individuals there are, the k value on the left, the program will try to come up with, uh, it's a Monte Carlo uh, simulation, so it doesn't always come up with exactly the same, but tries to get the best estimate of allele frequencies for those three groups, or however many you specified, that fits most individuals. It doesn't consider their ancestry, but we can then display it by ancestry. So here you can see at the continental level, we get a pretty good split between Africa, Europe, East Asia, Pacific, and the Americas. But Central Asia looks a little funny, and the Pacific doesn't come out until we allow the program to have more degrees of freedom to fit these data. And what you see starting at 5 and then through 7, at 5, Southwest Asia comes out as distinct. Remember the tree that had that little cluster of Southwest Asia before the cluster of Europeans. We're beginning to see this with only 39 SNPs, whereas the other was almost 3,000 SNPs, but randomly selected. And then we're beginning at k equals 6 and 7 to see that there's variation within East Asia and the Pacific. So um, you can read this, and we'll talk more about it. The other database that we were funded to develop is FROG. I like nice, uh, nice uh, names for things. Um, so here. URL, it's online, it's free, everything is open to the public. It's a pilot version. I'd say right now it's approaching a beta test point. <laughs> We've only actually had anything up on the web for a little over a month. And we made a special push to get things refined so you can play with it tomorrow. Um, and there are data input tables. You can put in a genotype, and what you get out, we put in the genotype at those 39 for a Mexican Pima individual, and what we got, match probability, now the title is changed for that. It's the probability of that genotype in that population which is interpreted as a match probability for individual identification. It's what would be reported in a court case. And notice, 
great, Mexican Pima comes out on top, but the next one, which is not significantly different, is the Hakka from Taiwan. Now, these are markers selected to show no variation around the world. And if you look, there are only two or three orders of magnitude between Native Americans and Yoruba from Nigeria. There's very little information on ancestry here, even though Mexican Pima did come out on top. And you can graph it, and the cursor is a running one that will tell you the population under that line. If we put in for an ancestry informative one, here's a Korean. That comes out on top, but the next three, by likelihood ratio, where significance is roughly, think of an order of magnitude, power of 10. It's a pretty good um, measure of significance. The next three are not significantly worse. So what could you conclude? Well, all of the top ones are East Asians, and all of the bottom ones are Africans. And notice, it's 30 orders of magnitude difference, 10 to the 30th. You can conclude pretty safely almost certainly an East Asian, very clearly not an African. And here, notice, again, the range of the log likelihoods is 30 orders of magnitude. So interpretation, we can go through this uh, tomorrow as we start on the computers. Um, so, I think SNPs, both ancestry informative, individual identification, and phenotype inference are going to be very important in forensic anthropology. We can already begin to get some inference. Uh, I didn't show you the, the locus that's thin and, wave, and or wavy versus really thick and straight hair. There's a gene that seems to be involved in that. I don't have the thick hair alleles. Um, there are other things and several studies underway for facial inference based on SNPs. Um, some very big ones, some not so big, not so great. I'm involved in the not so big, not so great one. But <laughs> um, here are various references. Here's the necessary uh, formalities. OK, were there going to be any questions? Yes? I have a couple of, I don't know if they're questions as much as comments. Um, population geneticist in me loves this stuff and I think it's fantastic and I use a lot of these programs to answer anthropological questions and demonstrate human biological variation but the forensic anthropologist in me says there are some practical considerations that suggest this technology is a long way off from being implemented and I don't know how often you come in contact with forensic anthropologists but Many of them are concerned of DNA and, and its role in forensic anthropology and issues like this. And I guess my comments are, um, forensic DNA labs are bound by their SOPs. And starting new panels are going to take a while, and they're going to cost a lot of money in order to get personnel that are trained to interpret them, that are going to optimize them on their machines. And so, that is one comment where I think this is still a little ways off. 
And my second comment is I come from a state where I work in a coroner system, and coroners have a very small budget, and their two questions are how fast and how cheap. And doing a lot of skeletal DNA work, I know that how fast is usually not as fast as you want it, and the how cheap is definitely not as cheap as you think. And when it comes to statements like a high probability they came from a certain part of the world, I think that's what we do as forensic anthropologists, and that we can look at discrete traits and answer a lot of those questions much faster and much cheaper. So I guess my general comments is that I think this is fantastic technology, but I just think its practical applications are, are a long way off in the, the forensic realm. They are clearly not here. Um, I disagree in my opinion of how useful they will be. Um, they can be very cheap. I would argue that they are probably a lot more accurate in adequate numbers and probably much easier to document that accuracy with respect to ancestry. Um, that's not saying you can't do a good job from bones. I mean, I'm, uh, my first faculty position was in an anthropology department, so I'm, I consider myself an anthropologist as well as a human geneticist. Um, so the technology is evolving so rapidly it is now possible for $5,000 to get a whole human genome sequenced at 30x coverage, meaning on average every nucleotide is sequenced 30 times, which makes you very confident of that nucleotide of that stretch of DNA. Uh, it means some will be poorly covered, but 30x is very good. There's still always a lag between forensic labs and academic labs, and that's because they, they are so strictly bound by their SOPs and what they're able to do in, the, in those laboratories. So I'm not okay. saying I don't think this is so, kind of technology, I just think that it's going to take a little bit longer to implement than... I think it's going to take a while to implement. But when there is better and cheaper technology, it should be implemented. It should be, but it's not. It's, and those people that work in academia and forensics see that things don't always work the same way in both fields. Oh, I know that. <laughs> um, maybe I'm an optimist, but it's coming. I know of depart forensic departments that are trying to work towards implementing this sort of technology. Um, a lot of money is being spent on research. Right now, I've got good funding from the National Institute of Justice to work on the frog database and to improve phenotype and ancestry informative marker panels. And because it's considered important. Now structure, which you're all going to play with a little bit, is very good at the population genetics level. It's used throughout the literature. It's not good in a forensic application. That's why we're developing frog. We can give you the likelihood of, for every population that's documented for a set of SNPs, we can give you the likelihood of that particular genotype in any one of those populations. And the more populations we have, and the better our markers, we can make a fine distinction between different regions of the world. I don't know because that's not my expertise, 
but how fine a distinction can you make looking at bones in terms of what population that individual came from? You should be pretty good. I'm What's saying, good? I come from a rural state. Fifty we don't different have a lot of, We don't popular. have a lot of money. And I just, um, you know, knowing about DNA technology, the thought of telling planners, you know, I can understand for positive identification. You know, oftentimes they're willing to spend the money for DNA for positive identification, but to spend extra money on, on ancestry when it's something that we can use other tools to do. How much do you think it would cost? to get an estimate of ancestry. I don't know. I know that the labs, the DNA labs we send stuff to um, for CODIS charge almost $1,000 a sample. Yeah, CODIS is an antiquated technology. Um, and with SNPs, you can probably do it for a couple of hundred dollars. And, and probably with faster turnaround than CODIS. Are, are you talking about using it as a chip technology? Is that yeah. the term? And, and what are some of the issues in trying to do that with the copying of the DNA samples? Um, are you talking about any issues? Have any of these been run with scalable samples that you know of? Or? No. Um, but these are markers for which there are not known copy number variants. So chips are used all the time to identify copy number variants. Um, that's somewhat different than typing um, SNPs on a chip. It's a slightly different use of the chip. Um, but yes, I think you could. F um, use chips, that's what everybody is thinking about. In a research setting, we aren't, because we are trying to find the SNPs by searching likely candidates that we then have to test on all of the other population. So we've got a very high throughput uh, system of typing 3,000 individuals in two hours, you know, for one SNP. Uh, and automated with robots and um, databases and electronic transfer, et cetera. Um, then we spend many, many hours analyzing the data. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's a. Our biggest issue is just dealing with skills. I think um, they're pretty automated. Um, well, in the future, I think. All the stuff that comes along with it. I mean, they're not the purest of samples, and there's not a lot of DNA, and I just wonder what, what potential yeah, problems there could be. All of those are potential problems, and you won't always find usable DNA in a skeleton. <laughs> well, it depends on how old the skeleton is and the conditions in which it's been kept. And no, we can do it. You just have to use proper extraction techniques, but we can't get those into the laboratories because they can't get those validated and then put them in a test tube and then put them in the laboratories to be able to get good enough DNA out of these samples because that takes time. And so we can't even been able, I mean, but both of your concerns are just a matter of it's cracking the ice. You know, right now, our kid is, you know, he's Well, I love it. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't try it. I say, we're not saying it. We're just saying that we, the we see the opposite side yeah. where and we can't, uh, the DNA labs, we have enough money to process the samples they already have, let alone get new technology and implement things. So it's just this question yeah. of, I think as it's academics, we're informing people and we're doing great work, but the question is, how do we get that rolling? Like the government's funding the research. Is the government going to buy new yeah, machines for the labs and train personnel? 
that's the question. Some How map, some, some, some map somewhere like in Colorado is going to take a chance, and they're going to have, for some reason, they'll have a surplus of funding for a short period of time. And then the results will get out. And police departments and DA's offices will say, you know, and his office, they'll, they'll talk to me and they'll say, well, we heard that Colorado was doing this. Can you guys send over there? So, sure, we'll send it off to Colorado. Colorado right. will do it. They'll start getting more business. And you know, I, I think it has become an expectation. That there will be. You know, they'll, they'll show it on CSI. And <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I always say that, you know, the real world in the forensic lab is not like uh, CSI, where the DNA sample or the blood sample or the crime scene sample comes in and the DNA results are available after the next commercial. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I know enough that it's not that simple. But um, Mostly I was am asking if you know if people are already working on some of well, those issues or have you um, seen any? I know Broward County has uh, tried the um, TACMAN open array technology on SNPs and they got some control samples from us and uh, we're doing some of these as a test. Um, there are papers coming out at various times. The, the Europeans have it very much approved to use their panel of 52 um, individual identification SNPs, which are not nearly as good as our 45 <laughs> SNPs, because there's much more variation around the world. Still, the largest probability they've gotten in any sample is around 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9, which is still adequate for most courtroom uh, situations, whereas our highest probability is in the Nasioi, where currently it's 10 to the minus 15, and there are not 10 to the 15th individuals. <laughs> send you on the way for today. I just, I did want to mention that remember Ken started out by saying that the most um, compromised samples from the World Trade Center um, disaster um, were the ones that were processed by SNP analysis. So they really are um, right, suitable for... Otis, right? Yeah. So short tandem repeat. Oh, okay. yeah. They require electrophoresis. What SNP did they do on the World Trade Center? They did some... They tried some. Um, but that's what motivated me because those they tried had little empiric documentation of how well they would work. So they were known what they were like in Europeans, but nobody knew what it would be like in a Chinese or Japanese. Uh, what the allele frequencies were. So um, that, that was what motivated me, having done so much testifying early on, I had a clear sense that the courts were going to require pretty good documentation if this was ever going to be accepted in the courts. So that's why I started to use our populations to provide documentation. That's why we're working on FROG, to make all of this ability available to anybody. If you've got that set of SNPs typed, we can tell you match probabilities or ancestry likelihoods. And they work well on compromised samples. So. Well, SNPs work very well on compromised samples, much better than STRs. Uh, well, I know part of the reason they use CODIS is because they can make comparisons across states and counties. So if we were to implement a new, a new panel, I guess the question is then how would we go back and 
we'd have to reanalyze all the stuff that's already stored in order to be able to use the right. panel. And buggy whip makers are not still around because nobody uses buggies much anymore. Um, there's a problem of shifting uh, to a new technology. I think for individual identification, which is what the database, the big uh, database is good for, um, there's likely going to have to be some parallel testing. It will certainly go on as, as the testing in a real lab goes on to get it more broadly accepted. There will have to be a countrywide acceptance of a panel that everybody will use. And several people are advocating the one I developed, which so far is plenty good. Um, and then there has to be a technology and a willingness. But in 10 years, sure, for old cold cases, maybe it's still relevant. But 10 years from now, a lot of the individuals in the database are not going to be committing crimes. They're going to be dead. Major criminals have a very shortened life expectancy. Or, you know, if they're out, they're shortened. If they're in jail for life, they're no longer committing crimes. So the existing database transients out over time. So sure, in two years, three years, five years. Of course, it's still relevant. What we have now, how relevant will it be in 15 years? Not very. So one has to be thinking, today is not the only thing to think about. So I'm not arguing that this is going to happen overnight. I well recognize all the problems, uh, maybe not quite as intimately in terms of the, the bureaucracy as you do. Uh, and I don't want to know that. I've got enough bureaucracy doing the research. But given my experience with forensics in testifying and the World Trade Center Advisory Committee, the Katrina Advisory Committee, I think I have a pretty good understanding of the system and what's needed, at least from the scientific point of view. And I'm trying to encourage companies to market a panel <coughs> chip that will implement these 45 ancest uh, individual identity SNP. The ancestry were still too far away. But in another year or two, there probably would be a small ancestry informative panel that most people could agree on. Could be subsequently amplified for finer structure. Be done together on one chip because you have the ancestry and <coughs> the individual identification all together, and it would be one $200 cost to run the thing, right. which is exciting. Yeah, when, it, when chips are mass, mass produced, you're underutilizing it just like they're, many on there. Yeah, they're very cheap. And in the meantime, there are. Uh, do-it-yourself chips uh, where you put a tag on the end of your PCR primer that binds only to one cell. And so you can, you can try it with do-it-yourself technology, if you will, in an individual lab without lots of really expensive equipment.